Over the last month or so, you have heard me talk with Jonathan Twomley, Anna Kelly, and others about the growing pain in the commercial real estate market. Earlier in the week, you heard from Jonathan Twomley talking about a trillion dollars in multifamily debt coming due over the next three or four years. But what I want to do here is I want to talk about the silliness in the commercial space that is a rhyme or a simile or whatever you want to call it to what we did in 06 and 07 in residential. I think it is comical and laughable to think that we just repeated the same mistakes in a different asset. And to have this conversation, we're going to talk to the one and only Anna Kelly, who remembers the last crisis and the one we're in now. So uh, Anna, this ought to be fun. It should be fun. And I will say I have the highest respect for Jonathan. You know, he and I were one of the only two people I knew in the multifamily space that despite coaching people in multifamily investing, despite investing in our own deals as operators, we were really warning people to start being really careful about using, you know, all this variable rate debt and yes. these bridge loans. And the fact that we were at a, a peak and nearing an expansion peak um, that really could create a lot of stress because people were way overpaying for properties because they could get leverage with interest only payments um, at really, really low rates and bridge debt. And so, you know, he and I were truly two of the only operators I know that refused to do bridge debt over the last mm -hmm. couple of years because we've been through this in residential in yeah. 2008 and 2009. We saw people go bankrupt simply because they had variable rate loans that they could not pay off when uh, the proverbial stuff hit the fan. Exactly. It is, it is scary similar. If we really break yes. down what happened last time. So I'll go one by one and there may be others. So the first thing, if you want to go back to the residential environment is we had a couple of years of appreciation with think 04, 05, and then the masses came in and the masses came in and it just became a feeding frenzy. I mean, there was a time you can go back and look at the articles where people were talking about flipping homes and flipping contracts. And it was just, it was easy money. And if you yes. flip to today, the last two years, it's all over social media, right? Bigger is better, value add, bridge debt, get in and out. My five-year plan got done in two, get all your money back. It was a casino. And unfortunately, the people that were early, they got out and are saved, uh, but it, it attracted the masses. So the, the amount of money that came into either residential in 06 or, or you know, multifamily or commercial it's just a huge wave and the money had to go somewhere. And unfortunately right. there was a lot of unscrupulous uh, operators who had fees and teams and all of this nonsense that took the money with a smile and mm -hmm. that's not going to end well. So that's the first thing that I see is similar. Yeah. You know, at, at the top of any asset bubble in any asset class, you have this irrational exuberance. I forgot who coined that term, but essentially at, at the top of cycles, it seems like nobody can lose. You know, deals are going really well because values just keep going up and debt just keeps getting cheaper. And um, banks are willing to loan. They tell you that they think your deal is great. And, you know, they're willing to, to work on the terms to get you into those deals because they profit as well. And so it, it's hard to see that as risky when you're in it because, everybody's done well, your bank is backing you up, um, investors are willing to give you money, and and you can get this false sense of security thinking the party's never going to end. And and that's what happened in, you know, 08 and 09. And that's what's happened in, in commercial real estate, you know, multifamily in particular, but even, even worse, you know, office and some retail and some other sectors, storage is starting to really feel it as well. Because basically, when you're in an environment of easy money, and you usually are to fuel an expansion, um, there's a book that I recently read, and I highly recommend it. I think it's by Chris Leonard. It's called The Lords of Easy Money. Mm -hmm. If you want to kind of understand the Fed and how they fueled these asset bubbles, um, in part, of, of course, there's there's greed. There's All investors in some way are greedy, right? We want mm -hmm. to invest for a profit. Um, so whether it's investors or the bankers or the you know mortgage companies, the, the home sellers, you can blame a lot of people. But really, when you're in a capitalist society that wants to do well and wants 
wants to do well for everybody. Um, the Fed typically le you know, leaves rates low and that fuels asset bubbles. And so we've had an asset bubble in commercial, just like we did in residential before. We're really in an everything bubble, but nobody saw inflation as bad as it was and ever thought that what has happened now you know, whatever happened. They just kind of thought 2008 was its own thing. It was just mortgage-backed securities. It was just mm -hmm. greed. They weren't thinking the Fed could actually completely rock the boat, change the system, and bring asset values crashing down. And that's what's basically happened. So while I do agree with you that there's there was stupidity, there was some naivete, there was just some lack of knowledge because of so many newcomers that had never experienced this. There was definitely, um, you know, some irrational behavior, some some greed. There are people that are coming down now who have absolutely committed fraud. But I think a lot of it is just people that don't have the history to understand what was possible. And therefore, they ignored the warnings of, you know, people like Jonathan and myself who said, wait a second, you really need to slow down and be careful with this, this debt because we don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. I mean, I, the, the beauty of having a YouTube channel is everything's recorded. A couple of years ago, yes. I, I talked about a, uh, a, a real estate meetup in San Jose, California that I was speaking at. And I remember there was about a hundred people there, mainly tech workers, right? Engineers, computer scientists, people who had options and stocks and all that stuff. And, you know, I was there to talk one rental at a time. You know, they, they listened, but you know, the Q and a after about 80% of the room, it felt was brand new syndicators who had never yeah. done a deal, but they had a buddy and they had friends and they could raise, they could raise millions of dollars easily. Mm -hmm. I got to tell you, I called it right after that meeting saying, this is going to end badly because I have been doing this before. And when you have real estate investing, good operators win. And when good operators get crowded out by easy money or stupidity or people who are chasing a fad, which I think syndication was an absolute fad, right? I believe there are great syndicators. It's a great business model, but it's just like Airbnb. When people are making money at it and they talk about it, all the masses come and that's where the problem occurs. It huh. takes prices higher. It takes, you know, they, they don't know how to hand, they don't know how to operate. They're, they're financial engineers. And they beat right. up a spreadsheet and then they lose their ass and, you know, people get hurt. So that's the first thing, right? They, it goes from being good operators uh, to financial engineers. So here's the second one. Sure. I can't believe this happened again. Variable rate debt. If you go yes. back and look at the vintage of 2006, which 2006 wasn't a bad year. We hadn't started rolling over in most markets yet. 50% of new loans were adjustable. 50. And that's residential. In yeah. commercial, it's always been right. uh, variable. But what happened in the last year or two is it went not variable, but it went bridge, yes. which is the same stupidity that happened last time. And now you have, you know, floating rate debt that's exploding. You have DS. There's there. So again, according to real deal, there's a, there's a, I don't know, syndicator called Tide Equities from memory serves. Yes. Bunch of financial engineers whose D DSCR is 0.6 now, not 1.6, 0.6. Wow. Right. So again, so what happened in residential is you went from 90 plus percent fixed to 50% variable. Now in the last couple of years, because the only way you could get deals because all the money is coming, the money had to be placed, is you went from variable to bridge. And guess what? That's going to blow up. That's what's happening. Absolutely. And and again, it's one of the things that Jonathan Jonathan and I were warning about. And mm -hmm. I will tell you, as someone who's, you know, in that space and speaks at events, I, I've met a lot of people who pitch me deals, you yeah. know, to either co-GP with them or to just invest passively. So I look at a lot of deals, not just my own. And I I really think it's somewhere to 80 to 90 percent of the deals that were pitched to me in the last year all had bridge debt. And so I Agreed. was like me too. a strong no. Um, you know, I I have operators that I I really like as P 
people and they're smart, they're smart people, but they haven't lived through a cycle like this before, who I said, you know, if, if we go agency debt on this thing and have at least five to seven years fixed, okay, I, I'll, I'll do the deal. The returns would be maybe a percent less, you know, instead of 20% returns, yeah. maybe you're like, you know, yeah. 18 or 19% IRRs, which were still really good. So we chose to go agency debt on everything that we did because of that. Um, yeah. But again, it, it's people not having the experience and being short-sighted. And I do want to say this as well. I, I do blame the Fed, and I'm not like a Fed basher, right? There's mm -hmm. good and there's bad. But I, I do blame the Fed's coming out early on and saying inflation is transitory and we will not raise rates. I cannot tell you how many mortgage brokers and how many operators quoted Powell and said, the Fed's not going to raise rates. We don't have to buy interest rate caps. Maybe they got um, agency debt, but, but but had the option to do a variable agency loan, which oftentimes the reason people do that, it's not just pure stupidity. It's because basically agency loans have huge prepayment penalties. So that if you're going to sell the deal quicker than that loan expires, let's say it's a five, seven, 10 year loan and you sell it early, your prepayment penalty can be millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. So even the agencies came out and they basically said, let's do a variable rate agency loan. Mm -hmm. You can buy a rate cap, but you probably don't need to because the Fed says they're not going to raise rates. And so they convince you if you're without experience to say, it's never going to happen. Maybe we buy a half percent rate cap or a one percent rate cap. Nobody saw rates going up, you know, as high as they did. So some stupidity, some, you know, trusting of those professionals that they brought in their circle to make them think it was low risk. Um, hindsight's clearly 2020. But I think the lesson for all of us is, is that Real estate ebbs and flows. If anything we've learned over the last couple of years, things we never thought could happen can, right? A pandemic, a national rent moratorium, a mortgage moratorium in certain areas, um, not being able to evict people, interest rates going up. Like you have to really prepare for the worst, mitigate the worst, hope for the best, but be really careful with your numbers, not mm -hmm. trust your financial engineering and your spreadsheet to, to be you know the worst case scenario because it could get worse. And you've got to have more reserves than you've ever had. You should lock in loans for as long as you possibly can. That's easier to do if you're in residential. It's almost unheard of if you're in commercial because most lenders won't lock your loan very long. Um, but even if you can't lock your loan a really long time with apartments, get an agency loan, you know, issued by the federal government and lock it in five, seven, 10 years so that at least you can sleep well at night during your value add and maybe sell it on a loan assumption and not have those huge prepayment penalties. So lots of lessons to be learned for sure. So I'll close with one final one. And that is a lot of people like to talk about the great real estate crash or great recession like it was a week, a month, a year. It was five years, mm. top to bottom. So we have heard some stories already that Houston deal, obviously real deals doing a great job of writing them, but this is going to be a slow series of dominoes that will fall. And plenty of people have lost money already and don't know. Plenty yeah. of cash in refis or calls for capital are going to Many, come. many. And there's going to be some fraud. There will be people wearing orange jumpsuits. Yeah, uh, it's already question. happening. You know, one of the one of the issues with this big portfolio you're talking about, the guy's name was Jay. Um, they've now had five large properties foreclosed on, and it's because they had bridge debt and they couldn't get them refinanced because the bridge was coming due. But instead of just saying, like, we've really made a mistake in getting this debt, we really you know, yes, investors are going to lose money. They've lost equity because of, of rates going up, decreasing their values. They took it a step further. And at least the allegation in the lawsuits is that they took investor money that was supposed to be buying a new deal and oh, used no. it to fund and float old deals. So there's a big group of investors with no, the same good. investor group who thought they bought a property. I think it was $20, 30000000 million raised. And all that money went to float other properties that still were lost. So 
that guy will probably end up in jail. And it's not the only story. So, you know, no, that, unfortunately, that's exactly what I thought was coming when all these new syndicators in San Jose, once they feel pressure. They're going to do that. They don't understand like, you know, there's they're separated. You can't do that. But once you start, hey, I, I'm i the portfolio of all of these and you take money that was allocated for A and you use it for B done. No bueno. Not good. And Absolutely. This, this guy, Jay, I, you know, I don't know who he is, but he won't be the only one that made. There are plenty of people that are big on social media that are, I don't know if you call it commingling or whatever it's called, but um, there's a lot of people under pressure and under pressure, they make dumb decisions. You have to be really, really, really careful. And, you know, another thing, you know, just shifting this back to kind of lessons learned. And and again, I invest in all kinds of things. And, and we've been investing so long, we have the ability to really diversify and invest passively in different things as well. But, you know, a lot of students came to me from big, big coaching groups and multifamily and said, you know, I joined these programs. Um, I'm having a hard time syndicating. They all tell people the fastest way to get in multifamily is to raise money for other people's deals. And I've yeah. said, because I came out of AIG, I dealt with SEC audits for years. I said, the worst thing you can do, the most risky thing is you raise other people's you know, deals, money raise money from people, and you don't even know what's going yeah. on with those deals. You have no control. So it was a really risky thing. But what I tell a lot of my coaching students is don't get the shiny object syndrome thinking that the, the most popular thing is necessarily the best thing for you, right? Or bigger is necessarily better or investing passively is necessarily better than actively. Um, so most people, if you're starting out, the way that I say is the surest way to wealth, not necessarily the fastest, but truly, it's the it's the name of the show. You buy yourself one rental at a time in your own portfolio, and yes. you hold those assets over the long term. And that's where real wealth is grown, where you yeah. have control and knowledge of your own deal. You're not putting your money in the hands of people that are kind of new and trusting that they're going to operate it. And if you yeah. don't want to be real active, then hire a property manager. Only do deals exactly. that are good enough to support full-time property management for you. But if yeah. you can own your own deals and buy you know, a, a deal a year for 10 years, that's enough pe enough money to change most people's lives. And at least by their retirement age to be set um, well, you know, above investing passively or in the stock market. So again, I, I raise money for deals that I operate, but I'm still going to tell you, you can make better returns on your own if you're willing yeah. to own smaller properties by yourself over the long term. I, I got to tell you that I could not imagine telling anyone other than if you really want to be a real estate investor, go figure out how to own a couple yourself. And then right. if you decide you want to go do other stuff, great. But until you've done it, until you've been in it for a while as an operator, you're just going to believe any shiny, slick salesman story. And you're probably going to lose your ass. I mean, that's what we're going to learn over the next couple of years. So Anna, that was a great right. way to wrap up the episode. How can people find you? Great. You can find me on social media on Anna Kelly, REI Mom, and for coaching and consulting, REIMom.com. Thank you so much. Thank you.